Hi, I'm Rupert Reed, and I'm giving a lecture this evening. The title of the lecture is The Horrible, Wonderful Truth About Climate. How facing that truth changes everything. Time's up. We are in the age of consequences. We are out of the safe zone. Sadly, it's a childish illusion to think that anyone or anything is going to successfully and safely fix this. This is not any kind of problem. It's so much bigger and more wicked than that. It's not the kind of thing that can be fixed. It won't be solved. It won't be fixed. It's a new condition that we're all going to inhabit permanently from now on. And it's going to keep transforming and for a long time it's going to keep worsening. It's a tragic situation. It's something that we have to, in a very profound way, get used to. They say it's an emergency, but even that understates it. What do I mean? Well, think about emergencies. Emergencies are situations where there is great urgency, yes. And emergencies are situations where you can do something about that emergency such that the emergency comes to an end. That is not the kind of situation we are in. Calling it an emergency understates it. The horrible truth is that the climate emergency, or rather the climate more than emergency, is going to go on getting worse for a very long time to come, and that some of us are going to end up being killed by it. People know this, and more and more of us sense it, and though these are difficult truths, people aren't just curling up in a ball. Why? Well, partly because more and more of us now sense that more and more of us now sense it. They say there are two stages to true transformational change. The first stage is when everyone realizes we can't go on like this. The second stage is when everyone realizes that everyone else also realizes that we can't go on like this. So if you're feeling it, my bet is that you are, or you wouldn't be here tonight. If you're feeling it, you're not alone. You're not mad. In fact, if you're feeling this already, then you are very sane. You are a vanguard of mental health. Mental health now sometimes means feeling fearful even depressed or desperate. These feelings, when evoked by the crisis we have entered into, are not pathological. On the very contrary, partly because what they are is actually spurs to act, spurs to make real the realization that there is something profoundly wrong with where we're at. So rather than people giving up, Serious climate concern in, and action is at last starting to hit the mainstream. As we wake up en masse, not only to our predicament, but to others waking up to it too. Fed up of business as usual, and with our reasonable demands having been thus far largely unmet, people are taking matters into their own hands. What do I mean by that? So I mean the kind of thing we've seen around London, London today with the big one, the new XR event, probably the biggest climate and nature happening there's ever been in this capital city. But more than that, I mean things that are bubbling up, mostly still below the radar, across the country, in fact, across the world. Things that are examples, crucial examples of, as I say, people in very ordinary and practical and important ways, taking matters into their own hands. I mean things like community climate action, exemplified, for example, by the wonderful iFarm that I've been to. This is on the Norfolk-Suffolk border. Uh, ten acres of land, soon there'll be a lot more, bought by a bunch of ordinary folks who've got together and bought it, and who are now turning it not just into a place for growing food and for rewilding, but into a kind of 
ever-growing community hub. They've taken over a local pub, for example, and are running it as a social enterprise. And they're really trying to reach out to the whole community, including conservative-minded people, of whom there are plenty uh, in that part of the world, and trying to get them on the inside of this emerging phenomenon. I mean things like what's happening in quite a number of professions now, what's happening among people who have woken up in advertising and in insurance and in the law, people who are seeking to change their corporations that they work for, if they work for a corporation, to make them climate compliant, or who are refusing to take on work for fossil fuel companies, or who are doing pro bono work for climate protesters, uh, and others. I mean things like the organisation Wildcard, which is trying to rewild the royal lands and is inviting huge numbers of people in to a campaign which has in it uh, all sorts of ordinary people and also people like Chris Packham, people who have been thinking for quite a long time, how can we break beyond the usual suspects? How can we get beyond people who self-identify as activists and appeal, well, ultimately, to this everyone, to the majority. There is already a majority of people in this country and in most countries in the world who are deeply concerned about this. What needs to happen is that concern needs to be even further and that can happen when we really start to face the truth and it needs to be thoroughly activated. We need a thousand, ten thousand of these organisations that I've just mentioned that are starting to spring up. The Emerging Climate Majority Project, of which I'm a director, is a rallying point for people, ordinary people, not a small radical flank, not just activists, who understand the depth of the crisis and want to do something meaningful about it. The Climate Majority Project is bringing together those who, in religions and civic associations, in neighbourhoods and communities, in workplaces and professions, are through with outsourcing, through with thinking somebody else is going to fix this or deal with it, through with asking others to fix this, and are instead determined to do our best together to mitigate, to, to mitigate it and adapt to it, to cope with it, even to flourish through it, in spite of it, and indeed because of it. Also because of it. What do I mean by that? This crisis is an enormous opportunity for meaning. Right here is a life's purpose, waiting for anyone and everyone who needs one. And I put it to you that there is nothing that our society so full of anomie and nihilism needs more than purpose. Now this centrality for human beings of purpose is something which many have understood for a long time. I think, for example, of Viktor Frankl, who wrote a magnificent book called Man's Search for Meaning, when, wherein he explains, for example, the astonishing fact that in the concentra concentration camps in World War II, which he survived along with very few others, there were things, it turned out, that were even more important than having food or water or shelter. And basically they were having meaning. That people who didn't have anything to live for would die even if they still had food and water. And the people who did have something to live for would live even without it. And I think going back further to the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, who said, what human beings above all need is something to will, something that they try to put their determination into. We have been lacking that in this society. Well, now we have it again. So you see, I started off by giving you, in very, very brief, a horrible truth. What's the wonderful truth? The wonderful truth about the climate crisis that I promised, that wonderful truth that I promised you, is contained in the horrible truth. Consider the mysterious pronouncement from the philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau. The remedy is in the evil. Look inside the evil and there you will find the remedy to it. Or by the great German poet Hölderlin, who famously said... Christ, I forgot what he said. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh yes, I got it. It's been a very long day. And I was up very late last night on news night. Uh, Holdelin uh, famously said, where the danger lies, there also lies the saving power. Where the danger lies, there also lies the saving power. In facing up to the crisis, in the painful realizations and emotions it evokes, lies our possible salvation. And here is the greatest reason why. When we allow ourselves to actually feel our pain, our fear, our grief, our anger, then we, many millions of us, are ready to act with determination to ensure that what is coming does not take us all down with it. Our grief, our pain for the earth, our fear and love for one another, these are brought home to us by the crisis. They emerge, they live, they transform. How does all this work? So let me outline very briefly for you how we understand this in the Climate Majority Project. We see our work as having four essential interwoven strands, and they go roughly in this order. So it starts out with fearless truth-telling, telling the truth, facing the truth, without reservation, however hard it, it be. This has been the truth, this has been the secret at the heart of the success in the past several years of totally unexpected phenomena such as Greta Thunberg and the school strikes and Extinction Rebellion. My belief is that this truth, this important fact, is far too important to be kept to just the radical flank of the environmental movement. It needs to and can spill over into millions, into the majority, and I think that is starting to happen. So you start with the truth. You start with, if you will, the horrible uh, truth. But that has to be processed. That has to be handled. That's the second strand. We need to do inner work by ourselves and more importantly together. We need to build a culture uh, of resilience. We need to talk about these difficult feelings. We need to face them together and work through them uh, together. This is an integral process now to any meaningful social change. It can't be ignored. It can't be thought to be something, I don't know, feminine or, uh, or, or marginal. It's absolutely central. So first strand, truthfulness. Second strand, shared inner work to face that truth. Once you've got the second strand in place, then you're ready for the third strand, which is action, activation. And I believe and I'm finding that there are hundreds of thousands, millions, soon many millions, who are ready for or already into uh, that stage. When you face the truth and when you handle it together, it logically moves into action. You've got to do something about it. People are hungry for those possibilities of meaningful action, those on-ramps to things that they can do to make some difference to this situation. And then the fourth and final strand is that we need to understand the whole of this process together. We need to, as people call it nowadays, sense-make together about this. And the most crucial part of that sense-making is the understanding that this process is happening, that it is, to a significant extent, inevitable, that this new moderate flank of mass action, this emerging, deepening, activating climate majority, is happening, is to some significant extent inevitable, is going to go way beyond the confines of activism. And for people to look around and see each other and notice that it's starting to happen, that it's happening in communities, that it's happening in workplaces, that it's happening in businesses, and so on, and so on. And of course, this fourth and final strand of sense-making, of coming to see ourselves as part of this emerging wave, this comes back to the two stages of transformational change, right? The first stage is everyone realizes that everything has to change. The second stage is everyone else gets included in that realization. Everyone realizes that everyone else is figuring that out too. As we come to see that together, then we sense make what we are doing into something massive and unavoidable. This, to very 
Antonio Gramsci. This is optimism of the will combined with realism of the intellect. This is an enormously hopeful trajectory. The horrible truth about climate transforms into a wonderful truth. But before you all go home on a high, <laughs> just to make sure there's no excuse in my words for the slightest complacency or false reassurance, take a deep breath and let's now dive even deeper. It isn't enough anymore to fixate only on slashing carbon emissions. It's way too late for that. We are in the danger zone. So we have to take seriously adaptation. We have to take seriously adaptation to the crisis. We have to take seriously how we're going to cope with the coming droughts, the coming worse than ever heat waves, the coming disruptions to our food supply systems, and more and more and more. So the climate question is bigger and more difficult than most people are still conceptualizing it as. And moreover, it massively overlaps with another question which is even more difficult and in an even worse state and even bigger, namely the biodiversity crisis or the extinctions crisis. I'm sure this is not news to many of you. For example, the Amazon, home to so much of the world's biodiversity and also the world's single greatest carbon sink. If we try to fix, which is not something we should try to do, but if we fantasise that we could fix the climate crisis without looking seriously at biodiversity too, then we haven't even really got to first base. But take another deep breath. We need to go even further. Consider the Ukraine crisis. Anyone who's paying attention can see that what the Ukraine crisis shows us is that there is a multitude of crises and they are all interconnected. The cost of living crisis, the energy crisis, the Ukraine crisis, and the climate crisis are really all just different ways of looking at the same thing right now in 2023 on this planet. It's for this kind of reason that people are now starting to use this big word, polycrisis. We're in a polycrisis. The climate crisis is the canary in the coal mine of this much bigger, still, multivalent crisis. So let's go further still into the polycrisis. I'm just going to offer tiny snapshots now. Climate and pandemics. Pandemics are part of the polycrisis. We all now know this because of COVID. But you may not know that there is research suggesting that there are going to be orders of magnitude more pandemics as a result of the climate crisis because of the way that it is shifting the populations of, for example, bats, which are one of the main reservoirs for diseases that then come to human beings. So pandemics, we are likely to have more and worse pandemics in the coming years, very likely, and that is interconnected with the climate crisis. There's been a lot of talk recently about AI, rightly so. My own belief is that AI is not what they call an existential threat. I don't think we're going to be entering into a Terminator scenario. You'll be glad to hear. I don't think that will ever occur, or if it does occur, it's far, far off in the future, basically because we're nowhere near producing real artificial intelligence yet. They can't actually think. Right? They just do unbelievable amounts of computation incredibly quickly. But make no mistake, AI is going to have disastrous consequences for the world in the coming years. It is going to break way more things than Facebook broke. We need to pay serious attention to it. And again, it intersects with the climate crisis in numerous ways, but one of the basic ones is that the sheer amount of energy it takes to train these AIs is absolutely phenomenal and terrifying. The climate crisis is what they call a threat multiplier. What that means is that multiple threats are made worse by it. And most terrifying of all, in a way, is the threat of nuclear war. Many of us are deeply concerned about. I myself am a, a long-time peace activist with Quakers and others. 
So again, we have an intersection between a potential existential threat, which is a real one, of nuclear war, and climate. This is an outline of the polycrisis. One more big word. There's also the meta-crisis. What do people mean when they talk about the meta-crisis? This is useful. Once you've started to get your head and your feelings, and it's not easy, around the polycrisis, you start to realize, actually, doesn't all of this, or at least an awful lot of it, get traced back to some much more fundamental root causes and phenomena? One of those is that there is, I would argue, and perhaps I'm in a good position, I mean, literally in this room, to make this argument, a fundamental underlying spiritual driver to the crisis. This is not just a crisis of political economy. It's not just a crisis even of how we live in a material sense. It's certainly not just a crisis that can be sorted by any kind of technological fix. Ultimately, I would argue, it is a civilizational crisis and a spiritual crisis. So this concept of the meta-crisis says maybe these diverse intersecting crises have some absolutely fundamental common root. I would say one such root is that we are spiritually, spiritually maladjusted to our home at this time in history and also to each other. So we are in a meta-crisis. We don't know how to live anymore. And that comes back to the point about meaning, right? So there's an essential, if you will, philosophical dimension to this. We need to refigure out how to live. And until we do that, this meta-crisis and this polycrisis are not going away. I want to mention three great obstacles to tackling adequately the polycrisis and the metacrisis and the climate crisis, of course. Three gigantic processes that stand directly in our way. The first of these is polarization, which we've seen becoming a severe problem in recent years. And we in the Climate Majority Project are very, very concerned about this. We are aiming to try to co-create a, a movement or a movement of movements which combats polarization because it brings people together to face these existential threats. Extinction Rebellion, which I helped to launch, was not in a position to do this, partly because Extinction Rebellion deliberately polarised. It deliberately forced a difficult national conversation. It did so brilliantly, but you can't go on polarising if you want to sort problems that require a post-polarised society, yeah? There is no possible way of making real progress on climate, let alone on other aspects of the polycrisis, without societies which are broadly internally aligned. So incredibly difficult though it is, we have to work to overcome polarization. That's the first obstacle. The second obstacle is perhaps even harder. It's the simple plain existence with which you will all be entirely familiar of capitalist markets and of limited liability companies which face um, quasi-legal obligations to maximize their short-term profits and returns to shareholders. I'm not going to say much about this because it's incredibly hard to deal with. I'm simply going to observe, A, this is something which makes it very hard to imagine really being able to handle successfully these elements of the polycrisis, including, of course, the climate crisis. B, nevertheless, we have to try. We have to try to put ourselves in a position through, I would argue, this kind of bottom-up transformative work and a potential change in political culture that could result to actually start to retain markets and limited liability companies in particular. The final one I want to mention, the final process, the final great obstacle is arguably the hardest of all. It is great power competition. Because if we imagine making some progress, for example, on taming AI and on dealing with climate and so forth uh, in, say, Europe, 
Well, how much of a difference will that make to what happens in, say, China or Russia? And insofar as you've got one major power or superpower or power block that is continuing to exacerbate these crises, including, of course, climate, there are built-in drivers for others to continue to do the same. This is incredibly hard to get around. But there are precedents. You know, we managed to successfully ban um, most uh, biological uh, weaponry and chemical weaponry, to some extent nuclear weaponry. We managed to successfully um, tackle the ozone hole problem in the 1980s. But the ozone hole prob problem was something like a problem. It was much simpler, much more specific than the climate issue is, let alone than, for example, the temptations that are on superpowers, etc. now to allow AI uh, to let rip. Great power po competition, geopolitics, is, I think, possibly the greatest of all the obstacles that we face. And I'm going to be honest with you, I don't have any answer to it. If you do, I'd love to hear from you. So this is tough. It's very tough to face. That's why we have to do this shared in a work. That's why we have to face it together. This is all part of the journey that we are now on. And I hope you can see in this whistle-stop tour that climate is really the thick end of a very large wedge. When you see that wedge properly, when you start to bring the polycrisis and the metacrisis into focus, you see more clearly than ever that system change is needed and also how very hard it's going to be to have that system change be the kind of system change we want. Because, let me reframe slightly, system change is coming. But before you get too excited or optimistic about that, the way it's coming is either that we will successfully manage to undertake transformations that will make some significant inroad into the poly crisis, into the climate crisis, or we will collapse. So system change is coming. This civilization, as we know it, is coming to an end. The question is whether we can manage to make that end transformational and broadly tolerable and indeed in some ways wonderful or not. But to come back in my final remarks to climate, climate remains the white swan in the room. What do I mean by that? You may have heard of this concept of black swans. My friend and colleague uh, Nassim Taleb famously argued this in relation to the financial crisis, that this was not something that anyone saw coming, or rather not something that anyone except he and one or two other people literally uh, saw coming. I'll tell you a little uh, anecdote, I hope you won't mind. Um, when, uh, when Nassim and I first met, uh, I got him to give a, uh, a lecture at the University of East Anglia uh, about the uh, financial crisis and black swans and philosophical implications. And at the end of the evening, I said to him, um, Nassim, you um, better sort out your travel expenses. And he clapped me on the back and he said, oh, Rupert, you, know, you really don't need to worry about that. Uh, you do realise that um, because I saw what was coming, made this huge bet against the banks. I don't ever need to claim travel expenses again. <laughs> Black swans are things that people don't see coming. Right? And we can see the outlines of all these things I'm talking about. But we don't know for sure what form they will take, and we don't know for sure if they will happen. But with climate, we do. Climate is a white swan. It is coming right at us. We might, with luck, escape nuclear war. We might, with some luck, escape these terrible pandemics. But all the luck in the world is not going to enable us to escape climate breakdown. It is what is going to happen unless we deliberately, transformationally change course. So don't be distracted. We need to look deep into the climate crisis. We need to concentrate on what we can see there, which interconnects with all the other crises. When we do this, we are looking deep into ourselves. 
The microcosm is the macrocosm. We need to concentrate on what we can find there, deep in our souls, deep in our failing civilization, deep in our profound interrelatedness with each other and with all life on this precious planet. And in what we want to avert from, when we look, there is the gift. The very difficult emotions that arise when we look deep into the climate crisis and see the polycrisis and the metacrisis and see deep into ourselves. The so-called negative emotions, eco-anxiety, heartbreak, even despair. These will be the making of us. Of that I am confident. Note that they all arise from love. Why are we angry? We're angry because we want to defend what we love and we're fiercely protective of it. Why are we fearful? We're fearful for ourselves and for others that we love of what is going to be coming. Why do we despair? Because we can't bear to face the situation that we sometimes see or sense or feel when we actually allow ourselves to open to the situation as it is. All of these difficult emotions, they all arise from love. They are forms of love. These difficult emotions are rational, yeah? If you're not sometimes afraid now, then you're not paying attention. If you don't sometimes feel desperate now, then you're probably not fully facing into what I've been outlining here this evening. If you're not sometimes deeply affected by grief about our situation, then either you haven't looked at it fully or there's something missing in you. These difficult emotions are rational and they are a huge and growing reservoir of energy. Fully embraced, they are all we need. Fully embraced, loved rather than rejected, treated as energy, they are all we need. The love that we are, whether taking form as effort, as sacrifice, as giving, as joyfulness, as grief-strickenness, as worry, as desperation, as presence. The love that we have for our children, for life itself, this love is an indescribable gift and a truly mighty power. Friends, let yourself fall deep into it, which means with and into and through all of us. There will be tears and dark nights. There will be impossible heartbreak and magnificent joy as well. Whether or not we survive, whether or not we flourish, the wonderful truth that I have offered this evening, the wonderful truth that I have offered is in the end greater than the horrible truth out of which it arises. Thank you.